Good morning. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Brandon. I serve alongside Pastor Kale, and we're glad you're here joining us uh, for worship as we gather together in the Lord's house uh, to receive His gifts and to be with His people. If you want to take a moment at some point during the first part of the service, fill out your attendance card. Let us know you're worshiping uh, with us. Uh, there's a, a, they're located in the pew in front of you. There's a white uh, card if you're a member, a gold if you're uh, visiting here with us. So we're glad that you're here. Uh, those will be collected uh, at the end uh, of a, a, after our, our offering. Uh, can be placed in the, kind of passed to the center uh, or that side and kind of uh, as the ushers come back, they'll, they'll grab those from you. Uh, with, with that, we'll begin uh, with our opening hymn. As you're able, please rise. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, 
and will be forever. Amen. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. With you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. Today's Old Testament reading comes from Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see the great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading for this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and there is no God but one. For although there may be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom, all things, uh, who, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things are and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. 
Food will not, be, will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat it and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have, not, who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you're able, please rise for the Alleluia. gospel according to St. Mark, the first, first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our sermon hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we continue our sermon series, God at Work, we've been talking about how God works both in and through us, and specifically kind of zooming in on the idea of vocation, or the various roles, the places God has put us. And with each vocation comes a certain level of power and authority. For parents, you guys have a certain level of authority. If uh, your, your kids are older, you have a little bit less authority. But you, you do still have some in that role that God has given you. If you're an employee, you have a certain amount of power in whatever your role is. If you're an employer, you have an even greater level of power and an even greater level of authority. Every vocation that we have comes along with it with power and authority and an amount of freedom to choose what am I going to do with that. Because really, that's the question that I'd like us to consider Today, with the vocations, the roles, the places God has put us, comes with power, comes with authority. But the question is, what do I do with that? What do I do with this freedom God has given me in the various places he has put me? One of the times I first remember wrestling with this uh, question was when I was in high school. See, my, my senior year of high school was kind of my first taste of power and authority because I was elected band president. I mean, talk about power, talk about authority, band president. In fact, after uh, I, I became uh, band president, one of my uh, buddies came out to me and he goes, you know, if you're ha having trouble making uh, these decisions, you just need to remember one thing. You're band president. You do what you want. I go, what? Talk about power. Talk about authority. And, and so later on, we, we kind of get to the actual start of the year, and I'm waiting in line like everyone else uh, to get our meal, and buddy comes up to me and he goes, remember what I said? I'm band president. I do what I want. You don't need to wait in line. Just, just go, go, go get your meal. All right? And so I, I had power. I, I had authority. I had this freedom to use it, and so I did what any teenager would do. We organized a dodgeball tournament. If anyone asks, I say, I'm being president. I, I do what I want. And so after a rehearsal one day, 60 of us went into our gym, played dodgeball. Not a teacher, not an administrator in sight. And let me tell you, it went really, really well. Let me rephrase that. It was going really, really well. It's so well, in fact, that, that I, I thought, I, I'm going to go grab a drink. I'm going to kind of take a, a breath for a minute, and things will be just fine. I'm out in the hallway, grab a drink, and, and I'm in my head and go, man, this is going awesome, right? And I'm out in the hallway for about a minute. I walk back in the gym, and in the minute I was gone, surely nothing bad could happen with 60 unsupervised teenagers, Right? No, in that minute, one of my buddies went into the janitor's closet, pulled out a 12-foot ladder, climbed up on the top of it, and was throwing dodgeballs in the middle of the gym from on top of a ladder. Now, a couple months earlier, I would have looked at it and go, that's hilarious. Way to go, buddy. But remember, I was band president. I had power. I had authority. And with that came a sense of responsibility. See, at that moment, I realized I can't just tell the administration if something terribly happens in this incident. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what to tell you. I'm band president. I do what I want. That's not going to cut it. See, no longer could I just think about my own interest or what I wanted. And so I had to talk him down from the ladder. We, we put it away, and we moved on from there. See, our tendency in whatever role that we have I have power and authority, and who do I want to use it for? Me. I'm band president. I do what I want. I'm 
dad. I'm mom. At some point, I want to do what I want. I'm in charge of the company. I'm running the show. I do what I want. This is how we, in our sinful condition, this is how we want to deal with the people around us. Because what we really want is when we look at our needs, and we looked at the needs of the people around us to go, no, I come first. My needs are more important. And really what happens in that is we make a distinction between us and the people around us. Is actually because I'm so worried about myself, the way I then view the people around me is you're not as important as me. You don't matter quite as much because I have freedom and so I'm just going to do what I want to do. And it comes so natural to us, we don't even recognize we're doing it most of the time. And this is what Paul is pushing back against in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, I know many of you, when you were driving to church today, you were remembering, all right, I got to park on this side, and that's what you're thinking of. But the other thing you were probably thinking about today was, okay, so for lunch, we're going to have sausage from the sausage supper. Now, for dinner, should we have food offered to idols? And you're, you're, you're trying to figure that out, and you go, man, I really hope the reading at church today talks about food sacrificed to idols, because I have this dilemma. I'm thinking about going to the, to the nearest pagan temple to pick up a Zeus burger, and I'm not sure exactly if that's what I... No, we, we hear this reading from 1 Corinthians 8, and we go, I don't know what they're talking about. We, we don't deal with food offered to idols. But what Paul is teaching here, he has a specific incident in mind in Corinth. But for us today to, to be impacted by this word, we don't have to worry about this specific incident. Actually, what he has to teach teaches us what do we do with the freedom that we have in our various vocations. What's the question we should primarily look for? Because our default answer is, what do I want? And what Paul offers us is a different question to ask. See, in Corinth, there was this issue with with food that was being offered to idols. Uh, Many of the the believers were were converts from these pagan religions, worshiping either the Greek or the Roman gods. And, And what they would do is they would offer these sacrifices so that the aroma would be pleasing to Zeus, to whatever god that they were trying to appease. And what mattered was the aroma. So what do you do with the meat? Well, you, you make Zeus burgers. Or at least that's what I th- assume that they called them. You know, you, you, they, they would take the food, they would eat it either in the temple or they would sell it and people would eat it in their homes. And this was a reminder. This was actually an act of worship towards that idol. So now those who have been converted from paganism to worshiping the one true God... They were struggling with the idea of of eating meat that was originally offered towards one of these pagan gods that they had turned away from. And the the, the stronger Christian, the the one who was more mature in the faith, looked at that and goes, well, those gods don't exist. That's that's what Paul says in the text. Those gods don't exist. You're free to do whatever you want. Now, the problem comes is when you go, well, I have freedom. It's not against God's law. And so I don't care what anyone else thinks. I'm going to do what I want. And Paul invites us as disciples of Jesus Christ to ask a different question. Instead of, am I free to do it? And then say, what what do I want to do? Paul says, no, first ask, am I free to do it in, in the law of God? But the second question is, How does what I do impact the people around me? In particular, those that are weak, those that are in need. He said, that's the question that you ask. And then at the end, maybe you think about, well, how does this impact me? What are my preferences? Whatever. But the first question we ask is, how does this impact those who are around me that are in need? Because in our pride, we want to put ourselves above others. Well, my needs are more important, which means you don't matter. But Paul has just said 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that you are not your own. You were bought with a price. And that means that life matters. That life is precious. And so the way we treat others in everyday life actually matters. Instead of looking down at people, overlooking their needs, only thinking ourselves, Paul says, no, what, what we do is what our God does to those who are weak, is we reach down and we pull up those who are weak. That's why Paul says at the beginning of our text, this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The question isn't, how can I get what I want? The question is, who can I build up? Who is being overlooked? Who is being pressed down? Who is weak? Who is in need that I can build up with the love of Christ? Because life is precious to God. It's why in the various vocations we have, we give thanks for those who are serving in ways that promote and that protect and that preserve life. Those of you that serve in the healthcare field. So if you serve in the area of mental health, working with people with special needs, helping deal with crisis pregnancies, with those who are in need of food, helping care for people at the end of their life. Those vocations matter. That is God at work because life is precious. Life is precious to God. So thank you for for all of those that that you serve in one of your vocations in that capacity to lift up, to build up the weak through your skills, through the love of God and Jesus Christ. And for all of us in our vocations, in the various roles, the places God has put us, to ask that question, who can I build up? Who are the needy around me? And how can I lift them up through the love of God? That's the question that we ask, not how can I do what I want. But there's actually a deeper problem going on here. There are times where we need to be reminded, hey, life isn't about you. You're called to serve those that God has placed in your life. But the deeper problem is actually, for many of us, we hear this text and we go, good advice, Paul. I should serve the weaker brother. In fact, that's what I've been doing. And you know what? I've been pouring out into others, but no one's been pouring into me. And I'm exhausted. I'm spent. I've got nothing left. So thanks, Paul, for your advice to keep going, to keep serving the weak. But what about me? See, the the deeper problem, this deeper issue here, actually I think impacts us maybe even more often. Instead of thinking so much about our own needs, we actually neglect our own needs. We ignore the fact that we need something because we become so convinced that I have to have it all together. Because if I fall apart, who's going to hold my family together? Who's going to hold the business together? Who's going to take care of all the things that need to get done? is I can't fall apart because I'm the glue that's holding everything together. I'm the one on whom everyone else relies. I can't show weakness because I have to be strong for everyone else. And it sounds good. It sounds altruistic. But notice what the common denominator is between all of these excuses. I I'm holding things together. I have to be strong. I, I, I. All this is, is a rephrasing of, I'm band president. I'm the dad. I'm I'm the owner. I'm whatever. I do what I want. You see, both in over-importance on our own needs and desires and a neglect of our own needs They're two sides of the same coin of pride. It's either what I want matters or I'm the only one that can do it all. 
both of it is the issue of pride. And what Paul invites us into on, on the one side is to look not for ourselves, but to look for those who are weak. But wh- when, we're in, when we're in the other, other camp and all we've been thinking about is the people around us, Paul actually invites us into something really vulnerable, something that doesn't sit well with us as independent Americans. What Paul outlines in 1 Corinthians 8 is this. It's okay to be the weaker brother or sister sometimes. I think some of you need to hear the permission Paul is giving here. It's okay to be the weaker brother or sister sometimes. It's okay to be at need. It's okay to not have everything all together. Because here's the truth. You're not the one holding all things together. You're not the the glue that is keeping everything secure in your family, in your business, in your school, in your community. This is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. Jesus is before all things. And in Him, all things hold together. Jesus is the one that everything depends on. He is the one that is holding all things. And that means you don't have to. That means you and I, when we're in need, we can be the weaker brother or sister. We can cry out to our God and say, Lord, help me. Lord, I need you. That's why we're gathered here in God's house, not as people who are holding life together, who who are the ones that everyone else rely on, but as people who come here and go, Lord, I need you. And God meets you here in his true presence. He says, this is given and shed for you. Because you matter. Because you need the gifts that God offers. See, so many of us, we know the right things, Right? Every time you get an air, on an airplane, they tell you, you have to put your own mask on before you can help someone else. Right? We know what we're, what we're doing, that, that we're burnt out, that we can't sustain it. We, this knowledge puffs up. We don't need more knowledge. Paul says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. See, what we need when we're poured out, when we're empty, when we're stretched so thin... We don't need the realization that there's a problem. We need love to build us up. That's what God gives to you in word and sacrament as he pours his love into you. But God also wants to work to build you up through the people around you. And so one question to ask yourself is do the people around me know what I need. Do the people around me know I'm struggling, know I'm, I'm just barely holding on, that above the surface things look great, but below the surface I'm fighting just to stay afloat? Do the people around me know? Because our, our, our tendency is to go, well, they should know. It should be obvious. They should be able to read my mind. They should be able to see that I'm stressed. No, if we set aside kind of our, our mind reading games or our passive aggressive comments that we throw at one another have we actually invited those that God has placed in our lives to care for us have we invited them in to our need do the trusted people that God has placed in our lives to care for me do they do they know what you're what you're dealing with do they know uh, how how stressed out you are do they know what you need God invites us not just to bring those needs to him, but also to bring it to his people. Because what we do as God's people when we see a weaker brother or sister in need, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. God has placed us in that weaker brother or sister's life, maybe for a season, maybe for a lifetime, that we may pour into them, that we may build them up with the love of God in Jesus Christ. That's God at work. 
God works through us as we value life in the various places that he has put us. But God also works in us as he pours his love into our lives, as he uses the people around us to build us up. See, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. May we be builders, not of our own kingdom, but of the kingdom of God who laid his life down for you and for me because you matter. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God, which guards our hearts and your minds, be with you until the day he comes. Amen. This time we continue uh, with the gathering of our offerings uh, as well as our children's message. So I invite our children uh, to join me up front. So I've got a, a question for you. This is one of my, my favorite things uh, to do in the world. But how many of you guys have ever held a baby? You guys ever held a baby? Yeah, it's, uh, some of you guys know that's, that's one of Pastor Brandon's favorite things in the world is to hold a baby. Um, and and uh, when, 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 you, when you're holding a baby or when, when you're on just a, a really little child, um, what, what do they do most of the day? They cry. Yeah. What else do they do? They sleep, right? Have you ever been around a baby, you're holding them, and they go, you know what, I'm going to clean the kitchen, it's kind of dirty. Have you ever seen that? No, I haven't seen that with a, with a little baby. Have they ever gone, you know what, I'm going I'm to wash mom and dad's car. Do they do that? No, no. no. You know, babies don't, they, they don't do any of that. They, they, they can't contribute that much to uh, taking care of of your house. They don't do any of the chores that we ask them to do. So why do we take care of babies? There's not, they, they, don't, they can't do much for us. Why do we take care of them? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we take care of them because you know what they need to be doing? They need to be sleeping. They need to be growing. Yeah. Yes, they don't know how to take care of their needs. And so who's going to do it? We are, because they are precious. You know what? That's how God views, not just, just babies, that's how God views all of us. He, he looks at us and he goes, you are precious, you are, are loved. And sometimes, most of the time, actually, you can't take care of yourself, and so I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to place you in, in, in a church, in a body, where you can be taken care of, you can be supported, you can be built up, because you are precious to God. Let's take our hands and let's, let's fold them. We're going to say a prayer. I'll say a few words, then we'll repeat those back to God, okay? Dear God, thank you for valuing us so much that you sent Jesus to save us. Help us to value life in everyone around us. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming up. You can head back to your seats, and uh, congregation will continue by singing the offertory.
give thanks to you for the many gifts that you shower upon us. We pray that these are tithes and offerings. A portion of what you've given to us would go that your gospel might be preached and others might come to know your word and your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. In our prayers for this morning, uh, we have a couple of updates. Uh, one is uh, Richard Grissom, the cousin of Mary and Jackie. Uh, Richard passed away, and so we're going to pray for, for Richard's family um, and all those who mourn his loss. Uh, we want to pray also for Leroy Bray Kane. Leroy was hospitalized this week with health concerns. He, uh, he had emergency surgery, and he's recovering from that. Uh, it went well, so that's a good thing. And then last but not least, uh, uh, a pretty exciting update. Um, Lucy Hale has been on our prayer list for a long time. Lucy still has a very long road in front of her, and so we're going to continue to, uh, to, to pray for her. She'll be on the, uh, the uh, prayer list for the foreseeable future. Uh, but the exciting news is she got to come home for the first time since July. So that's really, really exciting, and we thank God for that. As you're able, please rise for prayer. Holy Trinity, you are, a God of, you are God of gods and Lord of lords. Truly, there is no God but you alone. From you and from your Son, Jesus Christ, are all things. Reveal the saving knowledge of Christ's truth to us and to all the world, that loving you and loving one another, together we may be known by our God. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of life, you create and bless all life with your abundant care and mercy. Make us ever mindful of the many blessings that you've given to us in this life. Move us to share your mercy, protecting and supporting that blessing of life for all people, especially the unborn, the elderly, and those who suffer in the body. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, guard our families and our homes. Build them up in love. Support parents in their task of instructing their children. Strengthen those whose faith is weak. And make us bold to forego convenience and security to attest the truths of our most holy faith. Be especially with the households of our congregation, and particularly this week, Tommy and Jacob Thane and family, Brian and Tricia Thomas and family, Steve and Nancy Teak, Franny Tite, Lori and Jeff Tite, Ben Titzer and family, Lynn and Joey Tolbert, uh, Dean Tretchler, Tim and Cindy Tweedy, and Renee Valerie. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Almighty God, give health and success to our president, our governor, our legislatures, our judges, and all who serve for our governance and protection. Make them high in purpose, wise in counsel, and unwavering in duty to protect life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son cast out unclean spirits and taught with authority. He is the great physician of body and soul. Have mercy on those who are sick, distressed, in danger, or facing any need. We pray especially today for the family of, of Richard Grissom, for uh, Leroy Braycain, Wayne Schmidt, Laverne Goosewell, Rita Hatfield, seminarian Luke Onkin, Doris Warner, uh, Zach Niswander, Charlene Hallemeyer, Henry Gavin, Lucy Hale, Renee Valerie, Becky Bodenstab, Eunice Weber, Hilmer and Anna Mae Shanebaum, uh, Fred Dorr, Pat Benefil, Joan Goosewell, Becky and George Smith, Carol Booz, Marlon Shanebaum, Joy Lotz, Danny Wiesman, uh, Maria Whistler, uh, the family of Richard Grissom, Kimberly Hanks, Al Bolin, Larry Lovejoy, Henry Cruz, Gary McDonoghue, uh, Sandy Fix, Dan Cruz, Carla Klaustermeyer, Steve Sims, Paula Blair, Carolyn Wells, Henry Gavin III, Veronica Armentrout, Bob Huff, Jim Hubner, uh, Bill Sullivan, Jeff Frohm, Richard Dupas, Carl Monaco, Robert Rombach, Dale Jones, Don Goebel, Paul Knobloch, Catherine Manson, Missy Wiesman, Jennifer Withrow, Sheila Williams, and Dan Shane Hare. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the, feast, the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love, shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. As the glory of your presence once filled your ancient temple, so in the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, you manifested the fullness of your glory in human flesh. We give you thanks that in his most holy supper you reveal your glory to us. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood so that we may one day behold your glory face to face. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated for distribution. Uh, as you're sitting down, uh, just a couple things about what we believe about communion here at Zion. One is that the, the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus comes to us in with and under the bread and wine. So that's what you receive when you come up to communion. Uh, and the other thing is we see communion not only as receiving the body and blood of Jesus, but also as our, our expression of our unity and our confession of faith as Missouri Synod Lutherans. So if you're not yet a part of our church or part of another Missouri Synod Lutheran church, we still invite you to come forward for communion if you just cross your arms like this. And as you come around, uh, we'll give you a blessing and love to talk to you further about how you become part of our church, part of our confession of faith. God be with you during this time of worship.
As you're able, please rise for the new Demetis. St. Paul writes, this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. May we build up those around us as we daily care for those in need. At Zion, God's love works in and through his people. As the people of God, we leave with the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Thanks again for joining us for worship today. We pray the service will be a blessing uh, to you as you're sent out. It'll be a blessing to others this week. Uh, today is uh, Sausage Supper Sunday, so thanks for uh, hopefully figuring out where to park. And, uh, and we'll, I'm sure we'll see many of you throughout the day. Uh, if you're still wanting to, uh, wanting to help with that, we'll find a place for you. Come on up. Uh, 12 to 6 is when uh, we're kind of serving uh, the meals. Uh, and uh, there's plenty of opportunities both to, to eat and uh, to, to help out and uh, we're just excited for a great opportunity to serve uh, together. Uh, coming up this Friday and Saturday, February 2nd and 3rd, uh, there's a men's retreat uh, kind of for our district out at Camp Wartburg. Uh, and uh, the speaker this year, let me make sure I pronounce this correctly, Pastor Kale Hansen. I think I got that right. Uh, yeah, Pastor Kale is, is uh, serving as the, the speaker, so he'll be doing the, the sessions for them on that, that Saturday. Uh, but it opened for... for uh, men to go uh, this Friday, Saturday. Uh, there's more information on the, these flyers that are uh, at 
the, the little white table right as you walk out. You can pick up one of these, uh, and if it works out uh, to go to Camp Warburg, uh, you will uh, be blessed by uh, your time there this Friday and Saturday. Uh, on this past Wednesday, our, our ministry went as we hosted a, a Meet the Author night uh, with a former member, Terry Newneighbor, now uh, Bentley, uh, kind of shared her, uh, the, the books that she's writing that take place in an area that's called Bethel, but it's really close to Bethalto, and there's a church really close to Zion, and kind of how, how Zion and our community impacted uh, her, and so it was great to kind of hear her story, and, uh, and uh, if you weren't able to make it, uh, we're planning on making the recording of that available uh, at a later date, and uh, so if you shoot us a note in the office, we'll make sure we send that link to you uh, when it's available. Uh, the uh, other announcement I have before I turn it over to, to Bruce Doris, our executive director, is uh, Pastor Kale's Bible class, which normally meets downstairs, uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on downstairs, so it's going to meet right here uh, in the chapel. Uh, so uh, if you get lost downstairs, just head on up, uh, and uh, Bible class will be in there. Uh, my Bible class will still be in the library as usual. All right, Bruce. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I just want to spend a couple of minutes and talk to you about our 2024 budget that was approved by voters just a little over a week ago. Before I do that, though, I wanted to thank you so much for the amazing response to the appeal that we had back in December. Uh, a member of the leadership team stood in front of you and, and told you we were, we were really heading for a, a budget deficit that was quite concerning. And the response was, was just remarkable. It was just an amazing, and I just want to say thank you for that. It's really appreciated. One of the things, though, that we uh, came with one of our takeaways from, from that situation was the leadership team realizes we need to come and talk to you periodically about how the budget is doing throughout the year, rather than waiting till two weeks to the end of the year and, and start saying, oh, we have a big problem and we need, it, we need it solved. So you'll see someone up here just periodically, just spending two or three minutes at the most to talk about our, about our budget. Uh, the 2024 budget does carry an expected deficit. And that's really primary for two, two reasons. Number one is we, as everybody else, has continually uh, rising expenses. But we have had, over the last several years, a generally a flat uh, giving from the congregation. So that's, that's what the budget deficit is. is uh, that explains why we, why we have that. Uh, thankfully, Zion has some cash reserves, though. So we will be able to pay the bills this year. That's not going to be the concern. But as those of you who have budgets at home, you realize it's not sustainable to continue a deficit budget. So um, the leadership team asks that as you're, you're considering your blessings throughout the year that God is giving you, take that into consideration as you also consider uh, your giving uh, for, for throughout the coming year. If you have questions about the budget, you'd like to see a copy of it, there are still some left back there on the uh, glass in front of the the, uh, the church office. If there are none left there, you can check at the church office. If you have questions, Joe Brewster's our treasurer's here. Uh, I'm going to point to him so you make sure that he's a better guy to ask than me, but you can ask me. And the other person to talk to is Brian Bernilson, who is our director of stewardship. I'll be hanging around for a little bit afterwards. If you want to, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And thank you for your time. <laughs> 